Bonsoir. Welcome to Cocktails and Conversation, our weekly Thursday night assignation with me, Nick Luck in London, Mark Tuberty, our resident mixologist in Brooklyn, New York, and Brittany Erton coming all the way from what looks like a kind of office situation in Los Angeles. <laughs> 1980s power woman. Good evening. Oh, you're right. It is a little bit of um, th this was my ode to Breeders' Cup. This was my Breeders' Cup Future Stars Friday dress. So just, you know, bringing things full circle here. But yeah, it does have a bit of an 80s vibe, but I'm very into that. You look beautiful in Los Angeles. Mark Tuberty, you look so beautiful in Brooklyn again. <laughs> You Thank with your you, you with your little trimmed beard against your naked brickwork. Look at you. Mm. Wow, I like. I could all read right. into that statement, but I'll, I'll take all the compliments I can can what get. Nick. Thank you. I'm you trying okay? to a real bromance I'm here. Yeah, I'm trying to remain looking cool because it has been sweltering in New York, Brittany. I, you you probably know this, but the humidity and the heat has been kind of nonstop this week. But you know. Uh, I got to put on my cool face for you guys, and uh, I'm psyched for a really exciting show tonight. It's gonna be a lot of fun. So They're much in. to cover. So much They're to recap. Yeah. They're all in already. Lazy Dog, Dorian Dickinson, Jennifer Pinkerton Cook, Joan Ludlow, Katie the War Hero, E2 Tank Engine Streams, Mary Jane McKittrick, Lon Garfield. They're all here. Whole gang's here. Keep them coming okay. in. Thank you for joining us on this Thursday afternoon. Okay, let's start with the recap, right? Because both stateside and overseas, we had some really powerful performance. Uh, Nick, what did we witness in the Oaks with uh, well, you, you can have weird conditions, okay? So you can have an off track. You can have soft turf. Mm -hmm. You can have a substandard field. You can have all of those things. And maybe... We had soft track and a substandard field. Mm -hmm. But you don't get 16 length winners of classics. No. Not unless you, you know, secretariat. Anyway, we did. Snowfall, the Japanese bread filly by Deep Impact, uh, from the family of some of Bally Doyle's best, absolutely romped in the Oaks. 16 lengths written by Frankie Dettori. Putative, <laughs> putative second string with the stable jockey on Santa Barbara. I, I was at a, an event with Dottori last night, and he said in his 30-year riding career or 35-year riding career, he uh, had never known he was going to win a classic at such an early stage, and he's ridden 21 domestic classic victories. This uh, is unbelievable. Really? The look, and I wish I had the photo prepared. Wow. I didn't send it in. But the look on Frankie's face after he crossed the wire, and I think he was coming back to the press, was unlike any expression I've ever seen from him. Shock, surprise, awe, I, I, I don't know what it was, but incredibly impressive performance. What was the story behind, like why did she make headlines before this race? Oh, right, well, she's made headlines for a number of reasons, but first of all, she made a headline last year when she and her stable companion, Mother Earth, both ran in a grade one race for Phillies called the Phillies Mile at Newmarket. And because of COVID, they had a skeleton team come over from Bally Doyle, and then they had people meet them here. Uh, in England to get them to the track uh, who weren't necessarily as familiar with these horses as they might have been back home. Well, cut the long story short, they got them mixed up. They they weighed out wrong. They had the wrong jockeys on them. They had the wrong number cloths on. They went in the wrong stalls. They raced as each other. And it was only after a subsequent investigation that this was found out. Wow. Now, nobody thought either of these fillies was of much consequence. I think they finished third and eighth in that race. Mm -hmm. And it's come out one of them's won the 1,000 guineas and the other one's just romped by 16 lengths in the Oaks. No one's going to get them mixed up now. I mean, you couldn't <laughs> like it. It's ridiculous. I love it. Okay, so the Oaks was obviously, I mean, it's not the center stage of those two days, but what a powerful performance. What did you make of the Derby? Well, this is one of those races where you know how you think a race is going to pan out and it doesn't quite pan out the way you think it's going to. So therefore, you then assume that it's not as good a race as it might have been. Well, you can put a fork in that idea because just because the winner was a 16 to 1 shot and the runner up was an 80 to 1 shot, if those same if those horses had been the ones you'd fancied going into the race and those horses had done what these horses had done, you'd be saying it was a great race because the margin of victory was huge. The burst of acceleration between the 3 and the 2 was huge from the winner red cap there. Mm -hmm. And the time was great. So combine all those things 
what's not to like about the result? And it's, you know, like, like all three-year-old races at this time of year, you think, well, this could just be the beginning of these horses' careers, not the end. So they're all progressing at variable rates. So I would take a positive view of it. This is a day R. Great story for Godolphin third string, jockey Adam Kirby. The, the, the human interest story here was that Adam Kirby, the winning rider, 32 years old, mm -hmm. he was supposed to ride a much better fancied horse in the race called John Leeper. Dottori got put on John Leeper two mm -hmm. days before the race, took Kirby off. To, to, I mean, the, the owner did. Yeah. Right? Kirby then rings Charlie Appleby. Charlie Appleby puts Kirby on this horse, his third string, because he'd broken it in at his pre-training base. Mm -hmm. And he had an association with it, took a Sheen Murphy off it. Kirby goes and wins the derby. So it's karma, poetic justice, wheel yes. of fortune, whatever you like. But it was a great story. And he's a smashing horse, this by Frankel, Frankel's first derby winner. Wow, that's special. Wow. So I, um, thanks to you, got a hold of Charlie Appleby because he obviously had runners stateside in yeah. the Justice game, unfortunately. One, one yeah, Rebel Romance had to scratch from, or wasn't even entered, I should say, into the Belmont Stakes. And I said, hey, do you think maybe we could get a, a FaceTime you while you're watching the Justa game? And he said, uh, yeah, that sounds great, but let's see how the day goes first. Safe to say the day went really well. I didn't even try to FaceTime him because I'm sure he was just over the moon and then watched his one-two finishers in the Justa game. So it was a uh, group one, grade one victories from country to country <laughs> yeah and i want to i want to turn the tables now and ask you a little bit about belmont because i was fortunate enough to watch uh, the coverage from from back here obviously i you know this we do this every week i wish i'd been with you you're yeah. gonna say i wish i was gonna be at royal Ask. i didn't wish that you um, were here but i did i do wish <laughs> <be> at <laughs> Brit Brittany looked amazing she had a beautiful hat on but we were missing the tuxedo and the top hat right next to her that Anywhere. That that was probably the, the biggest absence you look, there. But. You looked okay. Not as good as Kenny Rice, but you looked okay. Um, let, me ask you, let me ask you about the races last weekend. I want to talk to you about, uh, about the Belmont Stakes itself. Mm -hmm. I thought it was a sensational horse race to watch. Mm -hmm. I really did. I mean, I, do you believe that just because everyone said how great Hot Rod Charlie ran, it doesn't diminish... The, the regard for essential quality does it surely it enhances your regard for essential quality absolutely and this is he ran to the expectations that i believe the entire team has had about essential quality from day one he reaffirmed his status as the top three-year-old as he was the top two-year-old but what i took away from this race is yes essential quality is a supreme animal but hot rod charlie is a real racehorse and i don't know yeah. if he's gotten the credit that he deserves maybe until this point in time. There were many of us watching this race, looking at the fractions, especially early, thinking those can't be right. They it, were it, correct. They were setting yeah. those fractions. Has somebody checked them? Yes. To make I, sure I, they were right. I, yeah, time form. yeah they did. They checked them because everyone was saying just how, um, you know, there's no way that Hot Rod Charlie could have stuck around doing that. But he's a straight up racehorse and um, essential quality. The sky's the limit for that one because he's had to overcome things and he still gets the job done. So Brad may have been right that in the Derby, he could have been the best horse, just didn't get the trip. Yeah, it was incredible just to see him set the pace and really just basically give the gas to all the, all the horses to follow him. But he hung in there the entire time and it was a complete <laughs> nail biter. Uh, but you know, it's interesting for me, relatively new to horse racing, watching it with my wife, Jasmine, and, you know, I, I told her essential quality is, you know, the favorite. He's, he's looking good. She said, but he's kind of hanging back a bit. And I said, you know, horses run differently and he's just waiting for his moment. So it was incredible to watch that happen. And then the showdown that happened right up until the very end, which was just amazing to watch. It really yes, was. you don't expect it in a mile and a half race, but it was great. And I can't wait to see where he ends up next. And obviously being a Breeders' Cup show, there were plenty of win and you're in races with the Met Mile, the Ogden Phipps and the Jiper. So um, lots of excitement from, from that weekend as a whole. Yeah. And gosh, it, we have the whole latter half of the year. I loved another, I loved that segment with you and the, and the um, boat racing guys as well. That was really nice. Oh, well, they're, I mean, I think that they were already prepped by being on our show. You know, yeah. they're very good on camera. Uh, did you see the celebrations afterwards? You don't have to give them much to say, okay, who who is a boat racing rooting here? And then they had everybody 
jumping up and down and cheering on Hot Rod Charlie. It was it was a cool thing to see. You don't often see yeah. it in racing anymore. Tell me the truth. When those two horses hooked up, Britt, did you were you were you letting yourself go and shouting, "Let's go, Chuck." I'm supposed to be impartial, right? I thought that we would have an insane winter circle celebration if Hot Rod Charlie won. I will yeah. say that. But big moment for trainer Brad Cox getting that first uh, first triple crown race victory. So well, hang on, hang on. Was it, was it his first triple crown race victory? No. Uh, if, yes, it, it was. A fit, no. His first, yes, that he can celebrate. Yes. Mandaloon. Right now. Be, yeah. Right now. Right on the heels. Um, everybody wants to still meet the infamous Jasmine, Mark. We're going to, I know, I say it every time. We have to make it happen. She's a little camera shy. That's why I kind of beat around the bush a bit. Uh, it's, we're going to have to take some convincing. I don't know what it's going to do. You know, what, what's, what's going to get her out here one of these days? But uh, she loves you guys. She watches every week. So she's just off to the, off the side of it. But my parents watch every week as well. Uh, which is fantastic. They're longtime Breeders' Cup uh, cocktails and conversation fans. So trying to make some of the cocktails at home too, which I'm excited for tonight's drinks. Mm -hmm. We've what got... Uh, Before yeah, so we bring in our very special guest, which our producers are angry, we haven't already brought them in. <laughs> I'll be fast. We're going to be making a Man of War cocktail. So talking about amazing horse horses in general and horse racing, we're going to be making this drink that was named after one of the most legendary horses in this sport. Uh, mm -hmm. It's an interesting drink. It didn't make sense to me on paper, but when I tried it, I was like, all right, that's that's the ticket. Uh, and then, of course, we're going to be making a Paloma cocktail. We all love a good margarita, but the Paloma mm -hmm. has been really surging in popularity over the past five or six years. And as we'll discuss, it's actually probably more popular in Mexico than the margarita itself. So a lot to get to. All right. Well, we're going to enjoy the Tuberty cocktails later. And Dorian says cheers to the Tuberty family in Connecticut. So cheers, Dorian. So say all of us. Brittany, a special guest, not his first time on the show. It's Royal Ascot. This is an American horse racing show. So it has to be. The one and only Wesley Ward, who actually I think is making his third appearance on Cocktails and Conversation. That's it. He's he's the most watched. He's the most watched. He's the most popular. He's the most valuable player. He's definitely the most valuable player next week. How are you, Wesley? Thanks for having me, guys. So you are in England, I'm assuming, at this moment. How are things? Well, you have to ask Nick that. <laughs> we're, doing, we're doing good, yeah. I, uh, we're, we're doing all right, aren't we? The weather, you brought the weather with you, which is fantastic. Yeah, but I'm, I'm ahead of you guys. I knew I was coming on and I went over. I got invited to Shake Fods tonight and uh, he had some great wine, so I'm way ahead of you guys. <laughs> well, it, it, won't take, it won't take us much to catch up. Um, we'll, we'll catch up soon. Yep. Yeah, exactly, right? So, <laughs> last, Wesley, we talked a lot about your wrong. career and, and leading into training, and we'll we'll move past that. But let's strictly focus on Royal Ascot. When did the fascination with that me in particular begin? Oh, you know, it's it, uh, a long time ago when, when I was kind of watching a little bit. Um, just thought I'd give it a, a try just because my two-year-olds were fast and early and Really, it's, uh, this game's amazing because it was a life changer. Um, you know, I didn't know how it all came about uh, as far as, you know, I, I just took a shot at it and how it was. It, uh, as Nick will tell you, a lot of luck's involved. And, and that first year I came over, it was extremely hot that summer. And uh, we had a super fast ground. And I've learned over the years a lot of things from coming over here. Um, but uh, I had some really quick ones and and they just bounced out there and they just held on and this is now listen our connection is not great but would you i mean the weather's beautiful at the moment it's set fair for next week do you think this is going to be like the quickest ground you've had since since back then since 2009 you know i don't think so i think um you know they, they water the course pretty good over there so they, they try to keep it uh, safe, unlike the first year we were there, and it was just really, really quick. Um, Chris Stickles, he, he likes to have a little give in the ground, even though it's it's hot. Uh, and that, that That's what will happen the first day, and then I think on Wednesday and Thursday, there's some rain coming in. So it'll be it'll be fine for me, though. I mean, I, you know, it certainly won't be a big, big advantage, but 
but I think that the horses I'm bringing uh, this year are really quality horses that can handle that little bit of giving the ground, and um, we're real excited. You say you'd be happy to win one, maybe two. I think I read that quote earlier. Why do you feel this contingent you're bringing over is so strong? You know, as the years go on, I'm, I'm getting a, a lot more support, so I get a bigger pool to choose from. And um, the ones that I have, two-year-olds anyways, that are, that are coming are, are, are a lot higher quality than in years I've had in the past. That doesn't always mean they're better, but um, these ones are, are, are really, really coming to hand, like in perfect soundness condition. And uh, they've already proven, proven worthy of coming over here because they, they've won. Um, and uh, we've got good spacing from races to races. So, mm -hmm. And the weather's great. So I, I just think we're going to have a big, big chances. I, I mean, you've become used to it now, but every year more of us want a piece of you for more of the build up to, to Royal Ascot. You're knocked around from pillar to post. You've got media guys and girls calling you every minute of the, of the day. Do you, I mean, do you enjoy the attention or is it, does it's like, oh, enough now? No, that's not the case. Um, I want to try to do everything I can for our sport. And it's mm -hmm. great that I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm one that can uh, kind of bring it uh, a real positive effect. And especially for America, you know, it gives a, a different flair to where we're, we're coming over to another country and we're competing and we're successful. And Mark came over as well with Teppin, you know, a really mm -hmm. good filly and, and um, more, more trainers are coming. And I think in the future, you know, this game's getting smaller now to where even more and more will come. And especially with NBC covering it and, and you, uh, Nick, and the beautiful Brittany coming over, I think that it's just going to be great. Oh, well, this is the one thing we're missing, Wesley, this year is Brittany. And now I'm not going over, sadly, but Nick will have all bases covered. Um, for you, Wesley, from the first year that you went over until now, how would you say that the reception from those in England has changed? Mm, that good <laughs> yeah no i wouldn't i would say it was good it was just uh maybe it was a fluke you know and that um you know with everything i just described earlier with the, with everything my way um but you know as years went on and you know i i have a distinct advantage the first part of the year i win a lot of the two year early two-year-old races and over here as well i think it's an advantage because i get now that i'm getting a better quality stock and they're kind of getting going early that it's uh it's an advantage as a lot of the better trainers you see, um, you know, even even at home, including here, you know, their their better two year olds are going to come out a little bit later in the summer and carry on. So mm -hmm. if you have a real quality horse that I've uh, instilled a little speed into them and brought it out of them, and they've already won and proven, and they know what they're doing, I think it's, you know, anytime in this game you can get an advantage like that, you got to take it. And uh, you know, as the years as I keep saying, with the the weather is everything here, unless you have a horse that's that's, you know, will take to the soft ground. Um, you know, we, we're just over here loving it. My, my children have been here from, since they're little guys and then they love, they've met, they've met a lot of friends over here and they, they each and every year they enjoy coming. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's just great. Yeah, it's complete. I know it's completely changed your life. I'm, I'm fascinated. I'm not sure this is, I've ever really explored this. That first year you came, you're a confident guy. You're a glass half full guy. When you sent that horse, strike the tiger down to post, did you have any clue what was going to happen? Or were you leaping straight into the unknown? No, I've said this time, you know, many times. Um, you know, I, I, obviously you don't go anywhere to run, especially as a, a place like uh, England or anywhere you go in Europe or anywhere in the world, unless you really think you're going to, at least going into it, you think you're going to win, you wouldn't go. Um, so, you know, I was very optimistic and like you said, I'm, I was very positive thinking we had big chances. And, um, when I got here, Mr. Ramsey, uh, had a, a horse named Cannonball. It was a, a very good horse and we ran him. Johnny, you know, uh, was lucky enough to get him to come and we finished mid pack and the first day here, um, coming into the track and, and, uh, and, and, and you see everybody with the top hat and tails and, you know, you're glad to be part of it and excited to do it. And when the first one got beat, I was like, oh, God, what did I get into here? You know, and, uh, and then the last race of the day came and I just thought 
yeah, it's going to be a good experience anyways. Mm -hmm. And he won, you know, and it was kind of like, um, I couldn't really believe it, you know? And, uh, then the, the second day, you know, the odds plummeted on my horse because people weren't quite sure if it was a fluke or not. And, um, mm -hmm. when she won jealous again and the queen Mary, it, uh, it really kind of set in once I got home and it, uh, you know, it was something that I just put an earmark on the calendar and I try to do and I have a lot of backing now. Was it that that moment, that meeting when you came back and did you notice that you got more clients out of that, more two year olds out of that? Was that the moment in time specifically that you thought your business really opened up? No, it took years and years for that to happen. You know, I mean, I think people wanted to make sure that that was, uh, you know, that that it's something that could continue to happen and it did and you know you 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 have to have the right clients as well that that want to you know pay the money and you know i've been fortunate i've got a you know a lot of the bloodstock agents gatewood and and uh, ben and the others that, that have you know got behind me and supported me and put horses in my barn that could do it you know first of all you got to have the athletes there and, and they put them there that could do it and then the ones you know as we get a little closer get there you know so it, it did take take a number of years though I wish we had the photo because I still can't to this day believe that you allowed your very first Royal Ascot winner, Strike the Tiger, who then became your stable pony, to be ridden by our very own Nick Luck. How wow. did that come about? And why would you ever do that? <laughs> <laughs> we know um, we, have a, we have a friend in um, Alex Cole and and his father, Paul Cold, and, and Nick came down to do a little camera shoot there. And uh, and I was sitting on the pony. I said, Nick, you, you, you got to get on this guy. You got to at least right, say the real one Royal Ascot winner in your day. And he did. He jumped right on there, and he was a hell of a sport. And away he went. And there, <laughs> Looked and like John Wayne, there. that boy. Looked like John Wayne. <laughs> we, we, stood, we stood stock still for about five minutes. <laughs> And then I could see that I could see this try the tiger was keen for to go for a little canter around the field. And given that given that I was wearing a pair of jeans and no hat, I thought this isn't a very good idea. Um, so yeah, uh, I wasn't I wasn't I wasn't a very good advert for <laughs> for like riding <laughs> riding in safety. But it was a it was, it was so, we we had a fun day. And I, one thing I love about what Wesley's done here is it's not just about following the same formula every year. You've kind of used it as a as a, as a way of trying to experiment a little as well. And uh, yeah, have you, do you think you've now found a perfect formula? I don't think anyone in racing will, you know what I mean? The, but, um, you know, I, li I like to get come and, and try different places, you know, different, different yards. And, and this way you can interact with, uh, with a lot of the trainers and especially older trainers here. I, I, I end up having a few dinners and pick their brains a lot. I can bring, bring home, something from that that i can instill in the my training methods at home and something that you would never see you know there's there's a lot of lots of different uh ways to train a resource and you know and then i ask a lot of questions when i come over yeah, i find that fascinating so what do you feel is one of the most valuable bits of information that you've learned from those overseas that you brought back into your training stateside um, you know, there, there, there's, there's so many different, different things that I've, I've found over the years, you know, there's so many, so many different, like the main thing that I've learned, um, as you know, when it, when it gets, uh, rains in the States, more often than not, they'll take the races off the turf. So you really don't get a good feel of if the horse likes soft turf, if a horse likes firm ground, um, you know, you really don't get that. I mean, very, very seldom. And uh, I, I really didn't even know that, especially being in California, you know, you're, you're always racing on, on for the first 17, 18 years of my career, you're always racing on, on firm turf. Uh, on the East Coast, you mm -hmm. get it a little bit, well, they'll leave it on. But um, you can really see uh, the horses here when you're running, especially at Ascot, if it's raining, it, it's strung out a quarter of a mile. And very seldom do you see that in, in turf racing in the States, you know, the, the first and the last horse are five lengths apart. So, um, you know, and, and, and a lot of the horses here that run on the, when it's just pouring down rain, they can run as fast on the soft turf as they can on firm. They're just like mud skippers. They just, wow. And so it's, it's you know, you, you learn a lot about that, especially even training. Like, 
I learned now working the horses because my main thing in training is keeping the horses sound and and especially when you're going fast you want an ideal conditions and rider and everything to be mm-hmm. perfect when you're letting them go in a in a workout to go in and out of the race uh, workout the same as they the soundness wise as they went into it um so uh, none of the trainers here would work when it's when it's uh you know let's say a, a big heat wave coming through here and you wouldn't even think that on a on, you know say a, on a santa anita mm-hmm. on a on a whatever day they mandate that you could work in years past and and, and um Belmont or what have you, like if the turf is firm, 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 and they haven't had rain for a while, and I mean, you, you would just go and work if that was the case. The trainers here would never do that, and I've learned a lot. You know, you can get injuries by that mm-hmm. way, and you just think, well, the turf is firm, we're going to work, and it's that's not the case. Mm-hmm. There are a lot of different things Interesting. Over here that I've learned that I, that I would never even know. Now, are we gonna are we gonna have a drink? Now, Wesley looks like he's already got one, just one. Mark we're, we're needs to, one. I, I, yeah, I, I, I know I've been doing water was, again. I'm trying to stay cool. I was at Chief Pod when we were drinking Promontory. He invited me over to his house here, and we were drinking Sasakaya. I just I couldn't wait for you guys. I wanted to, but I couldn't keep him up. <laughs> wow. Okay, Sasakaya is a wine that I have heard of, but could um. Let's just say I wouldn't be sitting down at dinner ordering for myself. But as a true connoisseur <laughs> of wine, Wesley, I'm sure that that went down very smoothly. <laughs> it sure did. I'm feeling no pain right now. Awesome. <laughs> we got to we got to get all the viewers Mark up to Wesley. Going. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna get all of our viewers up to Wesley's level. I'm gonna try to get there myself. Uh, I'm really excited for this first cocktail tonight because it is a classic cocktail. But, you know, when we think about what makes a classic, we we spoke about this when we delved into the Tory Cup and the Garland, the Breeders' Cup cocktails. To have a classic cocktail, it needs to be simple and it needs to have accessible ingredients, things that people have on hand whether they know it or not. So when I stumbled upon the Man of War cocktail, it fits the bill. We've got bourbon. We've got sweet vermouth. We've got... Cointreau or, or another type of triple sec and lemon juice, things that I've had around me for, for years now and I never knew about this cocktail. And I got to tell you, it looks a little funny on paper. We got two ounces of bourbon, a little sweet, right? Strong. Cointreau, one ounce, sweet, sweet. strong. And then we've got sweet vermouth, sweet. sweet, and then a little bit of lemon juice. I said, how is this going to work? But I tried it out. I'm telling you, it is a delicious drink. It's one of my favorites, but it also has a great legacy to it. It's got a great topic. So, of course, Man of War, you guys can fill in all the gaps of information that I have. But I even know that it was a legendary racehorse, right? American Racehorse of the Year, I think, in 1920. I believe he won the Preakness and the Belmont Stakes. Uh, interesting fact, if I, again, if I'm not mistaken, that he was actually featured in the New York Times alongside Babe Ruth that year for Outstanding Athletes. So that puts into context uh, this amazing legacy. He was, uh, I believe, the sire to War Admiral and the grandfather to Seabiscuit. Again, fact check, fact check any of that and tell me if I'm wrong because that's not my expertise. But uh, incredible legacy for Man of War uh, himself. And then, of course, the cocktail has stood the test of time. It first made an appearance in a cocktail book around 1953, uh, way back, but still it's popping up into... Uh, the vernacular today, and even someone like myself who prides himself on knowing a lot of classic cocktails has just discovered it, and I love this drink. So I'm excited to share it with you guys. Love it. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, let's just take a look at what we need. Again, commonly accessible ingredients, some sweet vermouth here, this for, uh, fortified aromatized wine. This makes sense, you know, it is sweet, but again, a lot of this is actually wine in the mix, wine and herbs. Um, so by the time this cocktail works itself out, it's not going to be an overpowering sweetness. Cointreau as well, it's triple sec, but even the word sec itself is French for dry. And the whole goal there is that Cointreau wanted their liqueur to be of such high quality that it didn't necessitate the addition of as much sugar. So even though this is a sweet liqueur, it again, it kind of works itself out once we add the acid in the cocktail. So to do that, we do need some fresh citrus, a little lemon here. We're only gonna use a half an ounce. I was kind of surprised by that, but I'm telling you it's gonna work out beautifully. Fresh squeezed citrus. I always sing the praises of that. It's gonna make a big difference for your cocktail. And of course, some Maker's Mark bourbon. 
So because of that little bit of lemon juice, this is a shaken cocktail. Again, remember that when you shake a cocktail, you're also going to really kind of aggressively dilute it, which I think is very important for this drink. We've got bourbon, strong. Cointreau, strong. We're even getting some alcohol in the sweet vermouth. So if you wanted a way to catch up to Wesley, this is the way to this do it. This is the way to do it. <laughs> this is the way to do it. So let's start making our Wart Admiral cocktail. Um, I'm actually going to start off by uh, doing some lemon juice oh, here. On, I thought it was a Man of War cocktail. It is. What did I say? War Admiral. Oh, I, I apologize. Yeah. Man of War cocktail. Yeah. Either one, whatever. Yep. <laughs> but yeah, well, maybe if there's not a War Admiral cocktail, then maybe I should start working on that. But yes, you are right, Nick. This is the Man of War. We're going to start off with a uh, half ounce of our lemon juice. Mm -hmm. So again, this is something that when I first saw the recipe, I was not sure if that it was going to work out. I thought maybe this is going to come across a little too sweet, but I really do like this classic, uh, this recipe and the proportions listed here. So half an ounce of your fresh lemon juice going into our mixing tin. And now a half ounce of our sweet vermouth. It's warm there, isn't it, Mark? It is. I know you can tell. That's why I've been drinking my water during the uh, the intro to the show. In his defense, I just got back from New York, and it is sweltering out there. It is stifling. It's, just, it's not comfortable at all. It's not. And uh, so you got, kind nice of a little, fun you got a nice little sheen on you there. <laughs> you know what? When I do when I do cocktail classes, I always like to tell people how to shop for good limes. And I always say that what you want in a lime is basically what we want our skin to be, which is a smooth complexion, but you do want it to be shiny. And I always tell people I know that's not what we want our skin to be like, but that's always mm -hmm. what my skin looks like by the time I get to that that point. But I can't even my, turn on the fan skin, here. I, I thought my skin looked that color this morning. I can tell you after, yeah. after <laughs> that last night. <laughs> yeah, but I can't even turn on the fan here because we, uh, so my younger son's birthday was three months ago and we get him balloons from this place close by. It's kind of like a, it's, it's sort of a convenience store, but they do balloons and these balloons use like uh, military grade helium because they last for months and months and months. So this balloon literally has been around since mid-March and just today it accidentally floated out and hit our ceiling fan. So I have to get up on the ladder later today and take it down, but it, it really stood the test of time i mean i think it's very sweet that you still get him a, a birthday balloon at 25 <laughs> yeah. 25 35 you know we got to keep it going and That's i asked for the same thing around my birthday too it's very so, cute let's go ahead and add some cointreau again 40 percent by volume on cointreau so oh, yes yeah. it is a liqueur yes drunk over here aren't you yeah <laughs> you know we're trying to uh, take it up a notch but yeah cointreau even when you use that in a margarita keep in mind two ounces of tequila, one ounce of Cointreau, Cointreau, one ounce of lime juice, you're still gonna have a very strong cocktail. Another reason why you want that aggressive kind of shaking with the, uh, the ice. So I love this. Katie says that there should be a drink named after Wesley. I agree that. with that. I, I I, I tell that Mark, send one over here. I'm going to need one in the morning, a little hair of the dog that bit me. There you go. There you go. <laughs> well, hey, Wesley, Wesley. What, are, what are your preferred flavors? What, what would that cocktail entail? Anything with alcohol in the morning, I'll be all right. <laughs> <laughs> we, honestly, I, I make that work. we've wanted to do a morning show. So it would be, well, it would be morning for me, probably a bit mid-afternoon for Mark, and then a decent time for Nick, and maybe make some sort of breakfasty drink, like a mimosa or yeah. the sunrise, something along those, or Bloody Mary. Come on. There we go. Bloody Mary, maybe a Bloody Maria or a Michelada, something like that. But yeah. It sounds like that that could be helpful tomorrow morning, Wesley. I wish I could send you one in the mail, but it probably wouldn't get there in time. Uh, we are going to shake this cocktail up. Now, anytime we're serving a drink served straight up, which is the bartending vernacular for a drink that has been chilled, but then it's being strained off the ice, you do want it in some sort of chilled stem glass. This is kind of a, a good uh, habit to get into. As soon as you're making a drink that's going to be served straight up, put some ice in your cocktail glass. Or even better, if you can stick it in the freezer, that's awesome. Uh, this is basically your only way of continuing to chill the drink after you've strained it off the ice. So mm -hmm. chilling the glass is like creating a mini little refrigerator for your chilled cocktail. The other reason why we use glasses like this, of course, is that because there's no ice to continue to chill it, we definitely don't want to heat it with our hand, right? So the stem is actually a practical feature that allows us to keep our body warmth away from the cocktail itself. 
I'm so bad about holding a glass of wine right underneath the, I guess the, the cup of it and rather than holding on to the stem. So say it's a glass of Chardonnay, like Nick and I like to drink, um, it'll be warm like that. Uh, just because um, yeah. it's cold. I, honestly, I'm drinking Glad Drunk, uh, an exceptional Chardonnay tonight. Nice. I just need a refill. But, I mean, it's just. Well, it's what, what's the label? What is it? It's Saint Aubin. Nancy. All around, this is a pretty fancy drinking night tonight, I think. I'm going to hopefully step it up with this uh, Man of War cocktail here, but the wines that we're hearing about sound fantastic. We're all a little bougie. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead and give us a good shake. We oh. definitely need this with this cocktail. Get some dilution. Make sure it's nice and ice cold. Naming all of Wesley's runners this weekend. Maven, Campanelli, Nakatomi, Lucci, Ruth, and Napa Spirit. Try <laughs> Twilight Gleaming, Coffee Maker, and Golden Bell. Did I get them all? Coffee Maker, yeah, I love it. Well, <laughs> well let me have a look. Let me have a look at this. So let's got, strain this. You got quite excited while you were doing that. Yeah, I love this cocktail. I really do. We're going to fine strain this too. Now, a lot of times I fine strain when I've got muddled bits of fruit and herbs uh, because we don't want that to kind of make the drink sort of clunky in appearance. You don't want that to get stuck in your teeth. But I also like to fine strain cocktails that I've shaken simply to remove shards of ice that haven't yet melted because ultimately that's just solid water. Once it melts, it's going to dilute into our drink. So this is a great way of controlling the dilution in the drink, keeping it sort of exactly the way we intended it to be when we shook it. Let's go ahead and garnish with a beautiful lemon peel and cherry. <laughs> Resistance. This is a cocktail worthy of a legend uh, and it will definitely help us all catch up to wesley cheers wesley that's our man of war oh, look um, at that. guys while we're here i want to say i want to say cheers and a very happy 40th birthday i mean i can't believe he's only 40 i had him down at about 65 <laughs> to my very good friend danny dawson he turns 40 today he's a good friend of all of us here at the breeders cup uh he's had a great belmont week uh and um we all know how lucky he is to be married to the beautiful Heather Higgins, who, uh, who is one of our, our bosses at Breeders' Cup. So Danny, one, of the, one of the great talented artists of our time, mm -hmm. 40 yes. years old this week. Um, keep, keep, you know, trucking and keep lying about your age. Uh, that's what I'm saying. Happy birthday to him. Wesley could lie about his age as well. Look at how young this guy looks. Yeah, I mean, you know. What can you do? What can you do? <laughs> I, 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 Wesley was Wesley and I were chatting the other day, and I was talking about the filly he runs in the uh, Coventry States. Sure, but not that one. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I said, "How? What is this? This horse, Ka coffee maker?" And he's like, "Yeah, coffee maker." I'm like, ah, <laughs> right. Yes, oh, coffee, coffee maker. Coffee. Yeah. Quite right, you know, yeah, Wesley, a... why is everyone talking about her? Uh, you know, she's kind of modestly bred Philly and really shouldn't be here, um, but she's kind of rose above all that. And she's been training great on the grass and she's, she's going to have a big chance. Mm. When you look back at your 11 winners, which is such a remarkable stat, 11 winners, is there one that... I, I don't want to say meant more to you than the others, but just was extra special. Uh, you know, it, winning a group one there for um, with with undrafted was really really special. Um, mm -hmm. And having the queen present you the trophy with the kids all there, and you know they've all got it on their home screens now, so that that really made it. And for he wrote it, it was a it was a thrilling race too because he. He came from way back and he made a big run. He rode the horse to perfection, and it was just uh, it's a it's a me memory I'll never forget. And you know, to so it was just uh, you know you, the Queen of England. What are you gonna do? You, know, you got to remember that one. <laughs> <laughs> and you've had some lovely conversations with the Queen of England. I'm sure you get asked this all the time. But what is it like spending time with her? Because she just appears to have such a true love and passion for the sport and these animals. Well, the first time I really spent time with her, I was uh, we, we were second in the Queen Mary with one of Gatewood, my buddy's uh, horses that he bought. And, uh, you know, it's, it was it's a great race, race to watch because they 
she crosses the finish line second and we had the lead right up until the last little bit. And then it kind of goes like I was telling you, you know, another horse comes and then just like an eighth of a mile strung out to, to the last horse finally crosses the finish line. And we had a big night that night over here. We were drinking and having a big, big time. And uh, so the next morning it was, you know, sort of like a walk day. So I slept in and at that time I was staying at Ascot at the hostel right there for, with the help, you know, so we were all staying right there and I got up and oh, I was feeling a little rough. And uh, so I went over and um, I had no name ever in that day, in the first race mm -hmm. and uh, checked on the horse. The boys had everything done and um, came back and my, uh, my oldest son Riley was there and uh, so we got all dressed up and I was feeling about like I'm going to be tomorrow. And, uh, and uh, so he uh, went over and I had a, a beer and then um, I had another beer. <laughs> and I, I, sat, I saddled the horse and, uh, you know, came out and Rosario was on the horse and I told him, wish him good luck and off he went and we won. And uh, so after the, winner's enclosure there. Uh, I got a tap on my shoulder from Adrian Bowman. He says, hey, the, the Queen's requested your presence. And I said, uh, <laughs> now, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, yeah. And so I said, okay. Well, th so then uh, we went up and they gave you a sort of what to do and what not to do. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I was, you know, my mind was, you know, with winning and the, the line from the night before. And um, I was like, all right. So we, we, I didn't know really what to expect. So we went and I sat down next to her, her and I, and it was really a great time to meet her because I had, I wasn't nervous at all, you know, based on, uh, mm -hmm. you know, how I was feeling. And, uh, and um, so she just started asking me a million questions, you know, you know this one, that, and that, and this, and this, and I just started firing her answers right back. And, uh, and they had a um, race coming up. That, so I stayed the whole race with her about 30 minutes. And she was telling me how um, she said that, uh, you know, she, she's been watching the races for a dec or uh, half a century. And she says, now they put these cameras down at her feet. She says, and she loves to watch the races live, but she finds herself drawing, watching the TV. And we're going back and, and, and they, the next race was the Queen's Vase. She only gives away two trophies, one Diamond mm -hmm. Julie, an undrafted one, and a Queen's Vase. And she had a horse in the race. And so a guy comes from behind her and um, after the race is over, and he grabs a trophy to bring down to the paddock with big white gloves. And uh, as we were talking for 30 or 40, you know, 30 minutes or so, um, I see her eyes kind of look over as the guy picks the, the trophy up. And he's got a hat on and the whole gear and all that. And, and, I, and, I, and I reached over and I tapped her on her knee. And I said, hey, I said, don't worry about that. I said, they're going to be bringing that trophy right back here. <laughs> she goes, do you think so? I said, do I think so? I know you're going to win. You're going to win this race. She was 20 to 1. And uh, so then, you know, we were all kind of getting up all in the same instant. And I looked back and that man, I said, there's about five of the security and everybody. I didn't know you're not supposed to touch the queen. You know, I didn't know that was Jonah. You know? And uh, I was going to get beheaded. <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> I missed that part of what they were telling me. But no, no, she won the race, so that was it. All worked out. Wow! Beautiful. It was it was the lucky tap on the knee from Wesley Ward oh, yeah. that won that trophy. There you go. And you know, Wesley, I've, I've heard that the queen has at least two Dubonnet cocktails a day also. So maybe she was already kind of, you know, coasting a little bit, and relaxing. So maybe that was part of why you guys hit it off. <laughs> Could be. Could be. Hell of a lady, though. Hey, I, I've always wondered, Mark. I, I don't think I've ever drank Dubonnet in my life. She she drinks gin and Dubonnet. Yeah. So what what is Dubonnet? Uh, du oh, unless I'm pronouncing it right, Dubonnet, it's, I mean, it's like a vermouth. It's, it's an aromatized fortified wine. I want to say it might have something like gentian or something that, that kind of classifies it a little bit more of like a kind of like a bitter aperitif, mm -hmm. but to be honest with you, I'm not sure, but that, that kind of goes in the realm of kind of a classic 
sweet martini because although we have a dry martini, which we all know about, right? Gin and dry vermouth. You mm -hmm. can also have a sweet martini with gin and sweet vermouth, which basically get its, uh, its origins back at the Martinez cocktail, which many people think is actually the predecessor of the martini itself dates back to the mid 19th century. And you can even have a perfect martini. So sometimes at the bar, if someone said, can I get a perfect martini? You'd actually have to decipher whether or not they really just wanted a very well-made martini or a traditional perfect martini, which would have both sweet and dry vermouth. Uh, what, but I think Dubonnet kind of falls in that realm, of like a vermouth. Wesley, would you, would you take a martini? Nah, I only drink red wine now. All right, so <laughs> I'd re I, I wouldn't make it very so is any so have any of your um you know slightly slightly uncouth English and Irish friends taken you to uh, Dukes in St James's? Oh, you were telling me about that, Nick. Right. So, so this is where if have I said this on the show before, if you have a martini there, I think I have. I think I said it a couple of weeks ago. If you have a martini there, you can barely get out the door. I mean, honestly, oh my God, it's brutal. I think there's something <laughs> like ten measures in in each one. So. Wow. You need to be really careful. They don't let you have more than two. Yeah. And I've seen, you know, I've seen people go in there for Christmas parties and things. And, you know, they may as well line up the stretches outside. Stumbling out. <laughs> yeah. No, no, I mean, I've seen people, I've seen people just, I mean, it's a very beautiful, old school, civilized place, but you've just got to know how to do it. And yeah. if you, if you, if you go overboard, you either, you're either in, in, on a stretcher in the gutter or you won't see your food for the whole night. <laughs> it's like, Nick, is, is, is the glass oversized or do they just fill it up all the way? No, they fill it up, but it but it's just everything so strong and so, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's the, way that, the way that it's done is, it's amazing, but I I, I don't have the-, the well, remind, me, remind me to never go there. Dukes, you said, what's the name? Dukes, Dukes? yeah. Okay. Dukes. yeah. Uh, if, I, if I come to London, Nick and I are going to Dukes together. That's what's gonna happen. <laughs> Great. And, then, and then we'll have great stories for season three or okay, four. Okay, Wesley and I will just drink delicious red wine. <laughs> it gets you to the same place. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just gonna, I'm gonna, just gonna parade Mark around London. And, do you know my friend? He's a mixologist. <laughs> <laughs> Look out! How well that will go over. <laughs> well, Wesley, I know you couldn't be there last year when Campanelli won, but what do you think the environment's going to be like this year? Are your owners able to come over? Is it still going to be the same sort of excitement that we've seen in the past? Uh, you know, I think um, the Derby was great this year. You know, I know there's not going to be as many people coming as the Derby, but um, Barbara's here. She's all excited. Mm -hmm. And um, her whole crew's here. So they're in quarantine and right now. I'm sure they're drinking good red wine, that's for sure. Yes. Uh, but, um, you know, uh, I'm happy to be back again. I missed last year and I was happy that I won, but, uh, it's not the same as, as actually being here on, on the track and enjoying it. So I'm, I'm, I'm real hopeful that life's going to get back to normal for everyone, especially for, uh, for ask it here. Cause this is, a, this is a pinnacle for me mm -hmm. and, um, you know, hopefully, hopefully everybody comes in and out of the race is safe, jockeys and horses and all. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm here and I'm looking forward to it. I'm excited. Here's, here's my take on it. I think uh, Wesley's going to romp in a few of these races because um, I, I've not seen many two-year-olds in this country. Ireland maybe a little more, but I've not seen many two-year-olds in this country that I thought, wow, wow, that's a good horse. You know, one or two, but not that many. There's a horse called Flotus for Simon Crisford in the Albany. I think she's a very good filly. Um, George Bowie's got one or two lovely two-year-olds, but honestly, I, I don't think they're 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 a vintage bunch here. So I, I'd be surprised if the weather stays good. I think Wes is going to have a good week. Um, do you do you believe this coffee maker is your is your best is your best two-year-old that you you're here with? Well, you know, as the years go on, you know, as I said, I've learned a lot. And this filly's got a real high cruising speed. Like she's going to go a little further than than my normal quarter horse type ones that I bring over. Um, and she's a very, very good horse so far, you know. And usually, the ones that win early and I came out, I I've come in the past uh, that don't really run too well. They 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 don't end up to be good horses. And the ones that do, 
end up to be very good horses. You know, mm -hmm. you just don't know that at this stage. So that's a little bit of an unknown. But everything I've seen in her, the distance hits are perfect. The ground, because it's going to be the first day, as you know, uh, is going to be good. It's going to be firm. They're supposed to have rain on, on Wednesday and Thursday. But, uh, you know, I'm sure they're going to water the track. But she's she's shown that she can handle that at Keeneland on the soft ground, soft turf, which Keeneland is uh, it's the track that more most uh, is most similar to, to the track over here in Ascot. So when they work good there, they usually run well. So I, I think she's going to have a big, big chance. Interesting. Uh, we've got Frank Oliveras wanting to say hello to you, Wesley Ward. Many will know Frank as a very talented jockey when he rode, but also the father of one of our good friends that covers racing, Christina Blacker. So he said, please say hello to Wesley for me. Frank and I go back 100 pounds. He's, he's <laughs> yeah. the same weight he is now, and I'm 100 pounds heavier. <laughs> did you, you ride again? Where did you ride against each other? At uh, Santa Anita and Del Mar. Gotta love it. Gotta love it. That had to, I know we've talked about this before, but how much did your riding career helped your, tr help your training career? Do you think? Zero. Really? Yeah, no. Nothing that would cross over. No, didn't, it didn't help it. You know, it, what, what really helped me was that uh, I got too big too, too soon. I, I rode until from 16 to 21 mm -hmm. and, um, It, it, it has nothing, no, there's no correlation between the two. Um, in fact, it, it's also, it's, a, it's almost worse to be a jockey from what I see uh, and then go on to training mm -hmm. because um, it's just two, two completely different uh, venues, you know, there's just, mm -hmm. uh, but, um, you know, it, it does help that um, I had some notoriety to, to help me to get some owners. You know, a lot of people think that that's the, the case, but, um, you know, training and, and riding is, is, are two completely different uh, it wouldn't help you at all. You still, yeah. You still get a kick out of being on a horse, don't you? I can see that. You just like it's like you were born to ride a horse. Well, you know, I started when I was a. You know, I rode my first race uh, at the county fairs when I was thirteen years old. So it's uh, it's like riding a bike when you get on them. Uh, but um, I, I do like riding from time to time. I really like to to get on the younger horses, and I get on the horse the problem horses. Uh, I think they more mind me now because of that, that hundred. Pounds I told you about that I'm heavier than Frank Oliveras. But um, it's uh, it's been a great go. It's been a great life, and especially now with this addition of Royal Alaska, or, uh, England, and Europe, it's just it's fantastic. I, I tell Should my we take a spin? Right, you get into something you love. It's never a day of work. You'll never work a day uh, in your life. So okay. true. That's so true. That's why that's why I'm still here at 11:53 p.m. That's why we're all having this conversation i just want to have a little spin through these runners i, don't, I mean I, you've done a million of these stable tours and told everyone what's going to do what but just for those who haven't seen we talked about coffee Mac. you know she'd be the first filly in over 100 years to win the coventry stakes if she won over 100 gotta be years. one right there you yeah go. <laughs> gotta be one um the obvious you know the the ruth in uh, a napa spirit you like ruth in for the windsor castle right yeah, um, you know, I, I've got uh, Golden Bell now, you know, I'm going to double, double enter her in, in that in uh, Albany as well. And mm -hmm. as we get a little closer, uh, we'll make a decision. To, uh, now, Spirit, I, I talked to Barbara and um, he's really race Sunday in Shantee. And um, after, after going over it with Ben McElroy in the field, certainly it's going to be a lot easier in, in Shantee than it is in uh, Royal Ascot here. I've won that race over there twice with horses that uh, have gotten issues or problems or gotten uh, traffic trouble in the races. We kind of wheel right back. And I, I, I thought that's a, a better way to go for that guy. So he'll be the only one that drops out uh, right now and he'll go over to France. Mm -hmm. So, so Napa Spirit goes to Sean T. Um, mm -hmm. You're going to, you're going to run uh, Twilight Gleaming and the Queen Mary, right? Right. She's, she's very, she's, she's very, she's, very good right now. She's serious, right? She, she's got, I, I, pound for pound, I think she's your best chance of winning a race. Well, it's it's certainly the race that I've had the most success in. We won four of those. So, um, and she's she's coming into the race flawless. I mean, she's, she's really traveled over well, had a beautiful work. We matched her with um, 
with uh, Barbara's other filly and, and she was she was better than her, Ruth. And mm -hmm. so that's why we've decided to put Ruth in, in, the, in on the same day um, in the Windsor Castle and go with Twilight uh, Gleaming in this race, but she's, she's doing great. What about your older horses? Because, or I say older, but um, the non two-year-olds, Maven. I mean, in the King's Stand State, correct? Is that where Maven's going? That's right. So, He's, uh, Nick, is that also Batash's race? Yeah, but what, I mean. What an exciting matchup. Have we lost him? Maybe. No, he's still there. Oh, yeah, we've got him. We've got him. We've got him. There we go. We see movement. We see movement. Okay, so what, I'm I'm clearly excited about Maven, but what are your thoughts? You know, I think he's going to have a big chance. That's why he's here. I, I, I wouldn't bring a horse, and that's the reason why we, we were taking up a spirit over to France. If I didn't think we had big, big chances to win, uh, this mm -hmm. one being one, he's been here before. We scratched, mm -hmm. and we went and won the race in France that we're talking about with that spirit. Um you know, he's overcome a lot of little minor issues. We gelded him. That's the reason why I think he, he ran so big. <coughs> and um, we gave him ample time from that win at Keeneland to now. He's had some big, big works where he worked um, with Kamari and uh, worked right with her, if not a little better than her, in her, in her, in her last workout there at uh, Keeneland. And, um, you know, if she was in the race, she'd be one of the choices. Mm -hmm. And so I'm really, really looking, you know, he's by American Pharaoh who loves the mm -hmm. turf and he, he liked a little give in the ground as well when he won that day at Keeneland. So he, and Batash, you know, you can't take anything away from him. He's a champion, but, but he is eight years old and my guy's four. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's two other things about Batash. One is that he's, he had a little sesamoid fracture and he's got a pin in it. So this is his first run since. So obviously, you know, he's working great at home, but you don't really know, how that's going to manifest itself on the track. Wow. Um, and the other thing is that, you know, he's he's very good at Asker, but he's not invincible there because it's not the fastest five furlongs in the country. You know, Goodwood, York, flat or downhill, he's great. But it, it's just that last half furlong. That's the end of his stamina limitation. And the faster they, the faster they go in that race, the more it, it, it kind of half compromises Batash's chance because... He's got to then see the. He's got to. He's got to hit the line and and hit that uphill finish hard. And yeah, that's that 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 will have the effect of blunting his his most potent weapon, which is just his raw brazen um, pace. So he's not impossible to beat. Is what I'm saying. Well, we're we got Johnny V up, and uh, he knows the horse, and he's riding. He's riding great for me. He's when bunch of races there at Belmont mm -hmm. on the horses that I've sent from Keeneland. So he's, uh, he's here uh, with his wife and he's quarantining and um, he's excited too. He's really right. excited. I love it. And then to of course, on your other runners, um, Wesley, thank you for staying up first and foremost uh, Two, thank you for all the insight on Aska and we wish you nothing but the best of luck. It's done so much, I think for Americans in terms of interest in Royal Alaska to see another American do so well. So with that, I think we should go out with one of my personal favorite of your Royal Alaska victories. Uh, perhaps maybe one of your most popular would be the great Lady Aurelia. Which one though is the question that will air? Uh, let's, let's, let's go with the Frankie. Oh, here comes the, here we go. the King Stan. Maybe that'll bring me luck. There you go. Do we have sound? Well, and it's Lady Aurelia now <laughs> hitting the front. She's quickening clear. And she's got this King Stand shot to bits for Wesley Ward. Another Royal Alaska winner for America. All right. Well done, Nick. Yes. <laughs> I think that may have been better than the actual call. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I'm not Britain's next race caller, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> it was good enough. Wesley, Wesley, you're an absolute superstar. Uh, we love having you here. Uh, you bring so much to Royal Ascot. Uh, I hope you uh, absolutely knock him dead next week. And uh, fingers crossed that uh, if it's not Coffee Maker, it's Twilight Gleaming. And if it's not her, it's Ruthen. And if it's not her, it's Lucci. And it might be all four, who knows, with Campanella and Maven thrown in. So, top man, thanks so much. 
Thank lots you. Of water. Lots of water Leslie? tomorrow, guys. There you go. Yeah, good luck tomorrow morning. <laughs> <laughs> Take care. Take, Take care, Wesley. <laughs> oh, good hey, man. Can I, can I just say, uh, what, what are we now? Uh, edition eight of this season, are we? Eight? Yes. Number eight? Right. How many did we do in the first season? 30 odd? 20, 29, I think. 20, yeah. 29. So, 30, so we're now, you know, whatever it is, 37 ed- episodes into Cocktails and Conversation. And in, in any of those, have you ever said to me, thanks so much for staying up? No. <laughs> it's, it's your job. It's not. <laughs> so, it's sometimes not maybe she's there. not thankful. So, yeah. <laughs> Wish he had right. gone to bed. No. Right. Right. Don't you love the look that he gives me when clearly he probably wants to ask another question, but then I'm like, we need to wrap. We're already over time. And so I just, yeah. thanks so much. <laughs> <laughs> wrap it up. Wrap it up. Um, um, Monsieur Tuberty, I think we need another drinky poo. Yes, absolutely. So, well, you, you guys can see it. It's it's hot here. The other day, I was walking with Jasmine, and uh, we actually we got a good walk in. We were walking about a mile, mile and a half. And our neighborhood in Bushwick is actually what's nice about it is that we have. I'm trying to interpret the shrug. Uh, I don't know. Walk, what's nice walk, is we walking with Jasmine. Jasmine. So walking by myself. No, no, no. I was walking with Jasmine. And what's nice in our neighborhood is we have a lot of Latin American grocery stores, which actually works out very well for me doing what I do because fruit is very inexpensive for the most part. I can find a lot of exotic purees and things like that. But the other day we were walking and it was so hot and it was sweltering. So we stopped into a little Mexican grocery store and we got ice cold Haritos soda. They look like this. And you can get them in any number of flavors. You can oh, get no, tan- the orange one. The orange one's great. Yeah. Yeah. The the orange one no. is fantastic. They have tamarinds. Have you ever had one of these, Nick? It looks radioactive. What a- <laughs> it might be, but it's delicious. You can power, and, you can power a nuclear plant with that. Yeah, yeah. Can we have a look at it again? Yeah. That's not a real. That's not a real. That's not a real food stuff. Well, again, every time you <laughs> put something up to that camera, it does look a little bit more neon. It does like look. Should I try this one? Great, what is it? Grapefruit flavored honey. This is, soda. This is grapefruit flavored. No, it's not honey soda. That's just kind of what it looks like. Haritos. It means uh, like a little jar. So a jarra in Spanish is a jar. So jaritos is a popular um, soft drink in, in Mexico specifically. And they have all these different flavors. And when they're ice cold, there is nothing more refreshing. Now, why would I be bringing this up besides the fact that it's hot here? Well, it happens to be uh, a very important ingredient in one of Mexico's most famous cocktails. Is it the margarita? No, the paloma. The Paloma is actually, some people say it is more popular in Mexico than the margarita itself, at least in certain areas. So now the traditional way to make a Paloma is actually just Blanco tequila, a grapefruit soda like our Jaritos here or squirt, and a little squeeze of lime. Very, very simple cocktail. Gets the job done. Really, really uh, refreshing and cold and thirst quenching. Did you say Did you say squirt? Squirt. Yeah. Grape, grapefruit flavored soda. Oh, all right. Yeah. <laughs> I swear it exists, Nick. <laughs> Keep rolling. But, yeah, it's, it's a very, very uh, thirst quenching cocktail. But of course, with mixology and craft cocktails, we try to find a way to deconstruct things that may look radioactive to some people into mm. fresh ingredients. So yeah. these days, when you order a Paloma, you're more likely to get it with fresh grapefruit juice maybe a little fresh acid like a, you know lime juice, maybe agave nectar and some club soda as a way of sort of reconstructing that grapefruit soda flavor without having it be full of preservatives and things like that. But I thought it'd be fun. Why not make both? Let's, let's do a side-by-side traditional Paloma alongside the fresh kind of uh, mixology take on a Paloma. So we're going to go kind of fast and furious here. We're going to make uh, the traditional one first. Very, very easy. We're going to start with a highball glass and fill that up with ice. We're not even going to shake this cocktail. Brian, Brian's been on. Brian says, dude, I've always made Palomas with grapefruit juice. Can't wait to try it. Yeah, it's, you know, it's a very easy way of doing it. Uh, it is very traditional, but sometimes traditional doesn't always mean the best version. It's just a different version of it. So for this, very, very easy. I got actually this really cool 
tequila. This is 1800 tequila, but they started doing these funky designs on the outside. Awesome. But we're going to do two ounces of tequila. I wish Wesley was here for this part because we're really going to take it up a notch. Two ounces of tequila going right into our glass. So, you know, I think we've touched upon this in prior episodes. This method of making a drink is called building a drink. We're not shaking it. We're not stirring it per se. We're building it in the glass. Very common with uh, simple highballs. In fact, this may even remind you of a Greyhound cocktail, which would be vodka or gin and grapefruit mm -hmm. juice. If you add a little salt to the rim, it's a salty dog. We're going to go ahead and do a little squeeze of lime. There was a horse today named Salty Rim. Shall salty Rim? No, I, I thought of all of you just because of. How did they get away with that? <laughs> that's awesome they ran to them. Uh, so guys all i did right there is squeeze a little bit of lime juice directly into the glass didn't even measure it just a little bit of lime juice and now we're going to top it with that grapefruit soda mm. so super super simple this might be how you would get it if you order it in mexico but we're going to show you how easy it is to make an elevated version of it as well little stir and that's pretty much it you could do salt on the rim. We could just keep it simple with a little grapefruit. So that's just one version. Let's take a, it's delicious. In and of itself, it's delicious, but I wanna taste it with fresh grapefruit juice. So let's take a look at how to do that. We're gonna start off with our citrus component. So some fresh lime juice. This is always gonna elevate things. Let's add three quarters of an ounce of fresh lime juice. So. Really what I'm aiming to do here is deconstruct and maybe reconstruct, reconstruct a grapefruit soda. So mm -hmm. we know there's at least some acid component. Most likely it's citric acid that's actually going into the soda itself. So instead of that, we're adding fresh lime juice. I'm sure there's sweetener in there. Maybe it's high fructose corn syrup. Hopefully they're using real sugar. Some Mexican products like Mexican Coke actually do, which is really great. But we're going to be using some agave nectar. Why not? It fits with the tequila theme. Mm -hmm. Agave nectar is also a really great syrup to use in your cocktails because you don't have to do anything to it. You know, honey, you do have to dilute it yeah. to make sure that it integrates properly with your cocktail. Simple syrup, you actually do have to make. Uh, raspberry syrup, syrup, the Dickinsons have been putting that to amazing use this past week. I have to say, uh, on Instagram, they were making clover clubs. They were making raspberry old fashions. They were putting me to shame wow. with the raspberry syrup. Uh, we got to start wow, showing some awesome. pictures of that. Yeah. But agave nectar is loose enough that you can just use it straight out of the bottle and it's going to add more depth to your drinks. Now let's add one ounce of grapefruit juice, just a nice pink grapefruit juice. Mm -hmm. If you can do that freshly squeezed, that is ideal. It seems like such a great summer cocktail. Very oh, it really is. Light. It really is. Yeah. And this is. Summers. Yeah, th this is something that you could really make a picture of. The mm -hmm. only thing I would say is wait until all of your guests arrive. You know, we might be able to start entertaining again soon. Mm -hmm. Wait until your guests arrive to pour that club soda in or top it per cocktail. But wow. everything else, if you're doing it maybe a, an hour ahead of time, go ahead and combine the grapefruit juice and the fresh lime juice and the agave nectar and the tequila. Save yourself some time. Make it easier when people arrive. You just pour it, top it with some club soda. And you're right, Brittany. This will absolutely cool people down. And it's, it's a popular cocktail. It really is. Not just in Mexico, but here in the States as well. So now some tequila again. We got a double dose here. Two ounces. Little flair for Nick. <laughs> <laughs> Your reflection is still this, very uh, good, Mark. Yeah, Thank you, Nick. loves the flair. <laughs> All right. So we are going to go ahead and shake this up. I actually want to show you another trick real fast. This is something I would do in the bar occasionally. You won't be able to see this, but because it's such a hot day, my ice, which I stock ahead of time for these shows, sits in a, a nice glass container here. It starts to dilute, though. It starts to kind of get smaller. It's surrounded by some water. So let me show you a cool trick for dealing with that. If you're dealing with ice that's starting to kind of break down, let's fill our tin up here with ice. Now you may not be able to see this, but there's a fair amount of water in there. Mm -hmm. What I like to do sometimes is actually take your Hawthorne strainer, swish this around, and I actually want to show you how much water comes out here. 
This is just with the ice. Wow. Look wow. at that. Wow. So I do not want to shake with that. I'm All gonna right. go ahead and put that back in to my container. And now at least my ice in here is worthy of shaking. So I've done that even in professional bars. If the temperature is a little too hot, if I know that the ice is starting to get very shiny, mm -hmm. I'll be conscious of that. And I'll, I'll kind of like uh, strain off some of that excess ice. I mean, we cannot have unworthy ice on this show. We absolutely cannot, no. We don't want unworthy ice. It Come must on. be worthy. So we're going to go ahead and give this a good shake. I'm going to start it. preparing. Okay, now. The rest of the ice. You're going to see a difference in the color of this cocktail. I'm going to do a side by side comparison. And then after the show is done, then I have the, the tough task of having both tequila cocktails. But whatever you got to do, right? All right. So nice and cold here. Again, I love straining over fresh ice, which is ice that has not been shaken or stirred with. Uh, remember that ice. Uh, basically, the larger the surface area, the more slowly it melts. Mm -hmm. So whenever possible, I like to strain over fresh ice mm -hmm. because that ice has not been broken down, right? So this is actually a good time good time to talk about some of these little kind of nitty gritty things uh, because as we get into the warmer months, you have to kind of keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. It's all going to affect the, the final flavor of your cocktail. So we're going to strain this over our fresh ice. It's Make so sure you lighter. Light, yeah. Well... It appears. So, oh no, darker. Wow. Okay. Wow. That's from you the see, fresh grapefruit juice. I, huh. I love and now, it. Yeah. instead of adding just regular like uh, seltzer water or club soda, I'm going to add Topo Chico. This is a very popular Mexican uh, mineral water that's sparkling. Mm -hmm. The cool thing about this is it actually has some salt in there too, in trace amounts. And remember that salt has a way of bringing out the flavor of everything. Mm -hmm. um, so you're not going to taste it, but it really is going to kind of flesh out the flavor of this cocktail. Would the, little, are you gonna give, are you gonna make is that gonna be a salty rim now you've done that? No, not a not a, not a salty rim, uh, but it is infused with a little sub threshold salt. Uh, these are side by side palomas. So you have the the quick and easy one, mm -hmm. which is actually very traditional. Uh, Blanco tequila, fresh lime juice, and a grapefruit soda like squirt or jaritos, and then we have our fresh version with Blanco tequila, some fresh lime juice, agave nectar, grapefruit juice, and some mi sparkling mineral water or club soda for effervescence. Mm. But this is this is a party in two glasses. Yeah. That might be the best word you've used all 30 some episodes. Which one? Trying to hit my stride. Almost effervescent. Nick's quintessential. Um, it's close though. Nick had a really good one last week. I forget, not last week, but uh, two weeks ago. It was a really, uh, Kind of trump each other on the um, the vocab words, but my my younger son is taking the SAT, so I'm going to try to sit in on some of those sessions and you know <laughs> see if I can use that to to fuel the uh, vocabulary. I'm not going to try and compete there. That looks delicious. Thank you. It does. Absolutely, guys. Uh, the, the second one, the one you did with the the um, yes. fresh mm -hmm. grapefruit yeah. juice, it definitely looks more within the realms of normality. And the, yeah. the, first one, the first one's got a certain kind of um, antifreeze appearance to it. And so, you know what it is, is ultimately when you think of all of these, whether it's a pre-made sour mix or a soda, the, the main trade-off, right, is when you're looking for something that's gonna be shelf stable, is you find ways of getting things that are naturally gonna go bad. So mm -hmm. lime juice, for instance, lemon juice, it oxidizes, it will go bad. So instead, oftentimes they'll use a combination of acids, citric acid, tartaric acid, malic acid to create the, that uh, citrus feeling to it. And then sugars, yes, they could use agave nectar or sugar, but oftentimes it's about the bottom line and you use high fructose corn syrup. So the benefit of doing a fresh version is you know exactly what's going into your cocktail and you know that each ingredient is of a high quality and you end up with a delicious drink like this so absolutely love beautiful. i love it what a way to round what out our show week eight i did before we go one go ahead hmm? no i was gonna say one more important notice Yes, one more important note, and I just want to get people aware of this. The Godolphin Thoroughbred Industry Employee Awards. I know that's kind of a mouthful, but those in the industry will be familiar with them. It's something that Godolphin has done year in and year out to recognize those in the industry 
for exemplary performance, really making a difference. And so there are seven different categories and awards. And over the years, they will do a, usually they will do some sort of event to acknowledge the winners. There's plenty of prize money and it's just, it's so worthy of drawing attention to the unsung heroes of the sport in all different aspects, whether it's racing, whether it's the in the corporate side of things or breeding. And so I wanted to bring this to everyone's attention because the nominations did open on June 7th. They will close on August 2nd and the ceremony will be on October 15th. So if there's someone in the industry that you really want to recognize, T I E A dot org and hopefully in a few weeks time maybe in july we could bring on one of the recipients of the awards to talk a little bit more about that but wanted to touch base on that the godolphin thoroughbred industry employee awards and we will close out nick luck with mm -hmm. our win and you're in races that you yes. will be covering from royal ascot yes win and you're in at royal ascot once again there are four win and your in races at the Royal Meet. I think we have got them for you. The Queen Anne Stakes on Tuesday is a win and your in race for the Fan Jewel Mile. The Prince of Wales Stakes on Wednesday is a win and your in for the Longines Turf. Last year was won by Lord North, and he's favourite for the race again. The Norfolk Stakes for two year olds on Friday is a win and your in for the Juvenile Turf Sprint. Uh, that's over five furlongs. And on June the 19th, Saturday, the Diamond Jubilee is a win and you're in for the Toif Sprint, the race that was won last year by Glass Slippers, who sadly not turning up at Royal Ascot. Too bad, but did Too pull what Diamond Jubilee. Oh, look at that. Oh, <laughs> Those were the days, weren't they? These were great, great days. That's uh, the great man after another, after another winner. Oh, please tell me we have my favorite photo. There's one more. Yep, this is a good one. We were on NBCSN. Yes, my all-time <laughs> favorite photo with the legend Frankie Dettori giving a kiss to the man he loves most. Oh, yeah, I'm not sure about the smile, the smile on Nick's face is priceless. Uh, look, at all the, look, at all, <laughs> look at that huge crowd in the background as well. Yeah. How we missed yeah. that. Um, still... Uh, we I was just going to say, as we roll out, a big announcement earlier today that you will be joining uh, Jessica Stafford on TVG. So we will get to see you there. Very much so looking forward to that, as well as the coverage on NBC on Saturday, correct? Yeah, if you, if you, if you, have, an, if you have a really visceral uh, dislike of me, then next week's probably not for you, to be honest, because uh, I'm getting where water can't. <laughs> But we're lucky to have you. Go Stradivarius. I agree. We'll keep my eye on him. Um, thank you, everybody, for watching and joining. Three weeks will be our next show, July 1st, as Ask Up for you next week. I'm out of town the following, so a big July 1st. We'll recap all of that, right? Yeah. And thank me for staying up. Thank Bye you nice. for staying up. Thank you, Nick. Love you guys.